Cool. Well, hello everyone. I'm Adrian, um, and I'm here with Billy the Atheist. Hi, Billy. Or Hi. Richard. <laughs> and um, so the general conclusion seems to be that last week we kind of were not really, we were pulling our punches a little bit, you know, maybe people expected there to be World War Three between the Atheist and the Christian. We're supposed to hate each other, apparently, Billy, but uh, we don't, <laughs> do we? Um, no, sure maybe it's partly because we're British, because us British tend to be a little bit polite and um, sometimes, you know, you have to listen carefully for the insult because it's hidden behind a, a veneer of politeness. But no, we're not going to be insulting each other. But this today, we did feel like we, we'd started a conversation and we wanted to continue it. So, um, and I think that's really important. And you know what's quite shocking is how rarely this kind of conversation seems to happen in our society right now. And I think it's a real shame. Uh, and I think we've both agreed on that, that um, the reason we want to do this is we want people to understand uh, each other and actually be able to listen to views that are outside your own little bubble, your own little your own little echo chamber, some people call it. So w would you agree with that, Billy? Absolutely. Yeah, completely. So um, I think we were talking about truth, weren't we? We wanted to talk a little bit more about truth, I think, today. Is that right? Is there such yeah, a thing? I'd like, to, I'd like to understand the concept of absolute truth and uh, mm. how our desire to, to find what may or may not be absolute truth can um, affect on our view of the world. Yeah, no, I think it's really important because I think there is a view today that you hear sometimes in uh, sort of sec what, I, what you might call secular, secular or atheists, I don't know, or, or just people who don't really like talking about God, whether they believe in him or not, maybe, because there's a lot of people who might believe or not believe, but it's like he's pushed to the, to the margin. There's this idea that came out, and I can't remember who it was who said, you might remember better than me, but some, someone put it this way, there is no such thing as absolute truth. Now, of course, the weird thing about that statement uh, is that is an absolute statement. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, contra co co bit of a, bit of a kind of, um, what's the word, self-contradictory statement, because if there is no such thing as, a contradict as, a, as an absolute truth, then that statement itself must not be absolutely true. And so you end up with a little bit of a circle. So, so yeah, so for us as Christians, this idea that truth has an origin in God and that there is a, a right or a wrong, there's an absolute, there's a yes or a no, and that to pretty much every question, um, there should be an absolute truth. And so, yeah, theories, opinions, all very well and good. But when it comes to certain that matters, it really does matter whether something is right or wrong. And I think most people agree on certain things like, you know, I don't know, kind of important to know whether the chair you're sitting on is going to break or not when you sit on it, for example. That would be an absolute truth, you could argue. Um, but uh, absolute truth, obviously, you know, I think different different areas of life and, and how you define that would perhaps be one of the areas we, where we disagree. Because obviously it comes, it comes into morals, for example, where you know we might feel that it's always wrong to take a life, some Christians would say. And, and other Christians would say, well, actually, maybe it's not quite as absolute as that. You know, what about police? What about soldiers? What about if someone's attacking you in a darkened alley and, you know, the only way to save them is to punch back and you end up killing them? Is that is that wrong? Is that a sin? You know, so there is this, there's, there's the moral side, but there's also the more sort of fundamental side of how the universe is set up. Is the universe just chaotic? Uh, has it got no no truths or, or has it got order and structure and, and truths and laws if you like the laws of the universe so that that would be the way we come from it I don't, I don't know how much that would resonate with you and how much of that you go no that's rubbish um well for a start i i'd look at there i'd say there is only one absolute truth or the field of absolute truth in this universe on if you believe in the concept of multiverses that would cross multiverses and that is mathematical proof math, mathematical proof mathematical truth Whatever mathematics work in our universe will be absolutely the same as anywhere else. No matter what the laws of physics were, no matter how the balance of uh, masses and forces that ever that made protons, neutrons and whatever else interact with each other, no matter what difference that was, mathematics would still be the same. Right. Uh, partly because it's conceptual mathematics is anyway. So that's what I would say is the only verifiable absolute truth in, the, in our universe. However, everything else... Hang on, does that mean you worship maths then? Uh, you know, no. Really? No, <laughs> right. uh, I, 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 understood maths. I, can, I wish I understood maths, but I, I accept it to be true based on the uh, proofs that I can see. Uh, right. And when it comes to other degrees of, of truth, that's going to be limited by our ability to understand it. And as you said before, I'm a physicist by education. Uh, physics takes an approach generally that it's probabilistic modelling, not absolute. So if we take, for instance, the discovery of the Higgs boson, um, uh, we look at that. Does the, does the experimentation say that the Higgs boson exists? Well, not absolutely, no. It has to 
adhere to, a, again, a set of print, mathematical principles, and it has to get to a level called five sigma, meaning that the observations made must have less than a one in three and a half million chance of being accidental. Now, if you were to ask me one in a three and a half million chance of it being accidental, I say that's close to absolute truth, but obviously it isn't. Because yeah. we're well, it's, I tell you what, it's certainly closer than, um, than in my field, because my, my scientific field is, is medicine, as you know, yeah. and in particular, um, clinical trials. And, and for us, the sort of the, the, uh, the gold standard experiments, which I think in some ways is one of the most amazing experiments that, that man has come up with that uh, has, has led to immense advance. And that's the randomized control trial where you compare a drug to either placebo or another drug. And you just randomly, either by tossing a coin or using a computer, you, you select people randomly to get one or the other. And then you look at the results. And it's pretty much the only way to know for sure that a drug is, is working or not, or indeed if it's causing side effects. Um, now, it might surprise you to know that deciding whether or not a drug works, I mean, which you might think would be more important than whether a Hicks bosom exists, um, in some ways, I mean, you know, uh, in terms of certainly in terms of the effects on, on, a, on our day to day life, um, we, we, use a, we use a level, if you like, um, of one in 20. So when you think about how many clinical trials are done, <laughs> you know, one in 20 is not that, that higher, higher risk that any drug, you know, that's why we do two trials though. So we, we would normally expect a minimum of two trials to both uh, be positive at that one in 20, although very often the trials are, are geared so they're large enough. So actually it's more like one in a thousand or, or one, even one in a hundred thousand. And you can tell that by the p-value. So we, we, you know, if you're looking at a clinical trial, there'll always be a p-value in there. And if it says 0 0.05, obviously five in a hundred, is one in 20. Uh, and if it's 0.01, that's one in 100. If it's 0.001, that's one in 1,000. So that gives you some degree of confidence. But of course, the other thing about that is you've got lots of comparisons within the study. So, you know, if you see like a whole bunch of side effects comes up and they're all the same, but you see your efficacy variable and that's different, then you go, oh yeah, okay, maybe, that, maybe, maybe that's more, more conceivable, more believable. So you do have to look at how many comparisons you're making. And I suppose yeah, interesting. I didn't realise you used one in three million in physics. Well, there you go. I mean, respect to the physics guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the far, I think it's one in three and a half million. It's five sigma anyway for for that kind of discovery. Uh, mm. And as you said about going back, as you said about the chair, we want to know if the chair is going to support our weight. Well, we don't know until we test it. Um, yeah. So again, that can't be an absolute truth. And even the moment you're sitting on it, it can't be absolutely true because it's true now, not necessarily true in 10 seconds, 100 seconds, 10 no. years on. Um, so yeah, so for, for absolute truth, I said, I don't believe, it, it, I don't like to use the word belief. I, uh, I understand that it may be difficult to quantify, he says with a very vague term. Um, but I have a desire to understand, but not necessarily to understand absolutely. And also that could partly be uh, demonstrated. I don't know if you're familiar with a, a, a mathematician called Kurt Gödel, who uh, has what's called his incompleteness theorems. And in, within that, he, uh, he postulates that beyond the most basic of models, it is impossible to define a model from within that model. So when we're looking at absolute truth, can we, can my sort of area as uh, a physicist by background, I'm not a particularly clever physicist, but those who are much cleverer than me, can they define our universe and within it? Well, we don't know. Uh, Gödel, Gödel postulates and kind of proves that we can't. Is that the same for a universe created by God? If God is outside of our universe, can we know uh, the, the absolute truth about our universe? And if God is inside our universe, how can we therefore interact with it and in, in, interact with God? And if we do interact with God, is that absolute truth? And if it's absolute truth, does that subsequently to, uh, to sort of quote Ulan Kalufid, does that mean that um, proof denies faith? And if religion had absolute proof, would the therefore potential abolition of faith be deconstructive towards, a, a, to, towards Christianity or other religions? Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. I mean, faith is an interesting thing. And I was, I was really intrigued by something you just said there, which is that you don't really like the word belief. And I mean, this is something, you know, that I, I've certainly seen um, other atheists sort of write about online, you know, because a lot of Christians will say, you, you, you need as much faith as I do to, to believe that, uh, for example, that the universe came, came completely from nothing. I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of Christians today 
by the way, um, will fully embrace a lot of what science tells us about the origins of the universe. And they might be quite happy with the idea that, you know, the universe is, you know, billions of years old, uh, that evolution happened. They'll, they'll just say that God was guiding that evolution because otherwise it looks rather, rather lucky, you know, that we had the outcomes we did. Um, and they'll talk about the Big Bang. And actually what's interesting is that a lot of people don't realize this, but until this idea of the Big Bang came up, um, a lot of um, non-religious people or people who weren't people of faith believed that the universe just always had been and, 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 the, and there was no beginning. And so actually the Bible always said there was a beginning. Um, and so, you know, for a lot of Christians, they would even say that the Big Bang is, is, is kind of, the whole theory of the Big Bang is very conducive with the Christian view of the world that actually it all came down to that big explosion. Now, the interesting thing is, what was before the Big Bang? And, um, you know, if you talk to the average physicist, um, certainly at a popular level, the idea is, well, it just was, and there was just this explosion, and it's almost like it came from nothing. And so you have this idea that the universe came from nothing, there was a Big Bang, boom, it happened, um, versus the idea that, that God set off the Big Bang, and that, you know, he was the one that, that set it going, if you like. And um, so I think those are two sort of completely different views of the world. Of course, nobody was there at the time. Um, so, and as you've said, maybe we can't prove that. So that's where the Christian would say, hey, you know, Mr. Atheist, you believe that before the universe was nothing. I believe that before the universe was God, you know. So we, we, where's, where's the difference in that? Isn't it, isn't it almost more faith to believe that nothing caused everything? I don't know. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the Big Bang doesn't... As me as an atheist saying this, the Big Bang doesn't mean that God doesn't exist, exactly as you said. We, we can trace the origins of the universe down to it being roughly the size of a beach ball. Uh, before that, we don't know. As you said, where did, it, where did it come from? Some people say, we'll have the argument, well, it's something, so it must have come from, from something. Uh, but the universe does have a met, net mass and net energy of zero. So on average, actually, the universe is zero mass, zero energy. So again, that is that isn't uh, an origin from nothing but we can't explain that is this as i said girdle's uh, theorems coming into practice we can't describe it from within um however i'm i'm, I'm particularly interested in saying when we said that how does how do you see the creation uh, argument then as an absolute truth do you see that as, as being important or does the creation argument have to have some vagueness built into it to uh, give the concept of faith well, no. Well, OK. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So, so I guess here's the thing, right? Um, the idea of the absolute truth is that there is a right or wrong answer to this and it, and it really does matter. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, you're, you're, you're more in the atheist camp. There's obviously another group that would sit somewhere between us who would be sort of agnostic. would say, look, we just don't know. We can't know. And, and why should we bother knowing? It doesn't matter sort of thing. You know, we live in this universe. We may as well just take it one day at a time. Um, and, 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 and you, some of those people would probably argue that they're a little bit more humble than you or I. You know, who, who's Billy the Wiz uh, to think he knows that there is no God? Who's Adrian to think he knows that there is a God, you know? Um, and, um, you know, and is faith one of the most arrogant things of all? And do you have your faith in no faith, if you like, or your faith, your belief in an unbelief, <laughs> however you want to put it? Um, you know, and is that as, as, as arrogant as mine and as certain as mine, you know? And so this, this is an interesting thing. But, I mean, I think... I guess the point is we can't necessarily know the absolute truth with 100% certainty because we weren't there, um, but we, we do bet our lives on it. You know, I mean, it's, it's a bit like when, um, I don't know, when, I just for some reason the thought that came into my mind is of, of the astronauts getting into the, the rockets to go off to the moon. I don't know if you saw that um, amazing documentary a little while ago about Apollo 11 um, that was put out, I think it was on Apple TV. And, uh, you know, you see them strapped above all this fuel that could explode, you know. And um, essentially, they don't know that they're going to make it to the moon and back 100% safe. But I reckon they're probably going to have to have told themselves that they will, because otherwise, why would they get in there? And in a sense, they're putting their faith, their trust um, in, in all the technology, but also in the people behind that technology, um, that, that they know what's going on. And I guess that's where the Christian comes is they say, well, look, I'm, I'm sitting in this really scary world. All sorts of awful things are happening. And I've basically got two choices. Either it's just pure chaos and no one's behind the control room, if you like. No one's in the control tower, I'm on my own. Um, and no one's designed this and no one's, you know, no one's responsible for my safety, if you like. Or I, I trust myself into the into the master controller, the, the, the designer, the, the builder of the universe who I can't see because I'm in my little capsule. Um, I, I might see some senses and some ideas and some things that give me 
hope, you know, like in your, if you're in the capsule, you sort of think, well, it's got to come from somewhere. Um, especially when you think about like laws of entropy, you know, I mean, when you, when we observe, let's say the law of entropy, I mean, I'm in my bedroom right now. And uh, if I don't keep my bedroom tidy, you know, if I don't pick things up off the floor and if I don't bring order and structure to it, pretty soon it starts to feel chaotic. Um, and so, you know, the argument goes, well, there's a, there's a human being, uh, there's a person, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an entity, there's, a, there's an intelligence that's bringing the order and the design into my bedroom, hopefully. Um, and similarly with the universe, that, you know, if the universe was left to its own devices, a lot of us would say, just can't see how, you know, how evolution could, could work without something guiding it, because there are so many chances for it to have gone wrong, you know, so many chances for, for us not to have had life at all in the first place, or for or for life to have just been wiped out so, in so many different occasions, or, or for, you know, for disasters to be worse. I mean, there's a sort of, even right, right now, you know, a lot of Christians have a sort of quiet sort of hope that although the universe sucks, you know, and although the world sucks, and 2020 is perhaps the worst year of most of our lives for many of us, that there is a benign creator somehow limiting the hell, you know? Um, mm. And, uh, you know, like, for example, you know, the, for all those 50 years that we've had people with a finger on the button, it's almost a wonder that the nuclear weapons haven't gone off. And so, you know, Christians would sort of say, well, you know, yes, man's evil, and yes, man has a certain amount of free will, but somehow behind it all, God said, well, okay, enough, you know, and it's enough. And, and the, the, similarly, there'll be a moment where it's enough, you know, and there's so many key moments in human history where, you know, certain things happen that just seem incredibly lucky. And so we would say, you know, we think there's a hand behind that. I don't know if that's making any sense. And it's, 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 so it's not that we can be certain of that, by the way, because faith, I suppose, always involves uncertainty. But I guess we, we bet our lives on it because I think if nothing else, and I'm, this is an honest admission, if nothing else, the alternative is just too dreadful. Okay. Uh, yes, I, 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 I heard that explanation before. I understand why people go for that kind of view. Uh, first thing I will say, just I, as an atheist, I don't believe there is no God. Um, from the observations I'm aware of, I don't see enough evidence to back the postulation that there is a God. That's, a bet, that's the more accurate way of describing it as an atheist, how we view it. Because as you said, uh, we can't prove it. I can't prove the non-existence of God. Uh, but I just don't see the evidence there to, to justify the belief in it. A probabilistic model for me doesn't work. I can see explanations that will be valid for phenomena people are seeing. So that's why I'm an atheist, not because I'm uh, a non-believer per se, I just don't see the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, going on to evolution, and you mentioned entropy as well. I'll quickly skip over that. I've, I've been asked before uh, by theists saying, how can evolution work in conjunction with um, the laws of thermodynamics, which yeah. state about entropy and energy transfer? And people say, well, it, it, uh, the, the laws state that every system will tend to its... Uh, its largest state of disorder so if yeah. that's the case how can we... like my bedroom <laughs> <laughs> indeed <laughs> indeed uh, so um how can you stay into the largest state of disorder so how can we have evolution now that uh, particularly how can we have evolution if there isn't some sort of intelligence that set it up you know or, or, or ordered it oh. some it's not that we, you well, know it's not that we necessarily don't believe in evolution but just evolution without an intelligence I'll come on to that bit in just a moment but first yeah. the, the the initial of uh, how should we say, biogenesis, how can that happen, um, accepting the laws of thermodynamics? Well, that's because it's a slight, for that argument, it's a slight misinterpretation of, or, of, of the laws of thermodynamics or an incompleteness of those laws. Because the laws that state every system tends to an, uh, a state of maximum disorder, say for a closed system, for any closed system, it will, it will stand, tend to a state of maximum disorder. That's why all the air in your room is distributed evenly through the room and not all sitting behind you in that nice little jug. Uh, but that's because you were not, that, that could be considered a closed system. But the Earth isn't a closed system because we've got, this, we've got the sun pumping energy in. So if we look at our planet compared to others, we have an atmosphere that means we capture energy. So we are no longer a, a closed system. And in fact, because we are capturing energy, that energy must do something. And what that energy will do is will create molecular reactions and it will create uh, more complexity. It has to by definition, because otherwise, where is, what is the energy going to do? So anyway, that was the sort of entropy part. Um, when you asked me, what the, there was one other part you said, sorry there about evolution or, oh yes, yeah, sorry, evolution, what drives evolution? 
Yeah. Um, evolution, how I understand it, uh, and with your background, you may well know this much better than I, or studied it much better than I, but it isn't, I don't see it as being guided, and how I understand the evolution, there is no guidance. It's a kind of uh, brute force technique. Take, for instance, if you wanted to crack a code to hack some, uh, some financial system. You can use a technique called brute force where you just try every single possible combination until you find a combination that works. And that's how I kind of see how evolution works to an extent. We have mutation after mutation after mutation. Every single organism is mutated in some way from its original. If it wasn't, we would look exactly the same as Adam and Eve and we'd have no biodiversity. So basically I understand that evolution works by billions upon billions of mutations, but only those that happen to be conducive with the environment at which it's in will continue. So only those mutations that allow us to reproduce. So is there a guide, guide in hand? You can argue from a, a non-theistic point of view, yes, and that's the ability to, to create further life. Um, to, quote, um, to quote Richard Dawkins, I think he said here, to sum up evolution, um, forgive me for being a little crude here, he said, get the sex in early. He said, species survive and mutate are those that can recreate, reproduce. So if we had a mutation that made it that uh, we were able to reproduce older, that wouldn't be beneficial to the, to the continuation of this race because there's a higher possibility of us dying out before we can, can reproduce. So is there a guiding hand? I don't see it as a guiding hand, but there's a driving force behind evolution as I see it. And that is the ability for any organism, whether it's humans or whether it's amoebas, to reproduce. So yeah, that's how I see a guiding hand. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because of course, you know, what we're really talking about is two very different forms of the universe, um, which, you know, I think when you're sitting here in this world of suffering, this world of pain, um, you know, leaves you with two sort of things. And this is where, you know, for a Christian, you know, the idea that there is a God out there that uh, is somehow responsible for, for this world being the way it is, you know, even if he has worked through evolution and through all of these natural processes, but he, he set them up, you know. Uh, and some people would think of God as very disinvolved, that he just sort of, it's almost like the blind watchmaker, he, he, wind, he winds up the what, clock and lets it go. Other people say, no, he's, he's actually intimately involved and uh, in all these little decisions and influencing them one way or the other. And, and, and just little tiny coincidences that we sort of think, well, that looks to me like that was really useful for me. And so for a Christian, they might see something happen in their life that an atheist might just go, oh, well, that was really lucky. I was really lucky there. Uh, and the Christian goes, actually, no, I think, I think that was God's provision. Uh, I mean, a lot of Christians don't like using the word luck. They'll say, no, that, that was providence. That was, that was God's guiding hand. That was God protecting me. That was God looking after me, you know. And, um, mm. and so for me, for example, you know, just little things like um, I was very sick, for example, and I was really struggling to get the care I needed. And, um, you know, and there were certain things I did to try and get access to different doctors and it was just quite interesting that on the final day where I went to see my GP and I said, listen, I really think I need to see a specialist because this local hospital that I'm under, I've been going up there every day. I just don't think they're helping me. Uh, and I still feel really ill. And I mean, she took one look at me that day and saw how gray I was, um, my face and everything and, and said, yeah, you know what? I will refer you. Now, you know, if I'd have had a different GP, maybe they wouldn't. That afternoon, um, because she preferred me, uh, I was able to go up to that hospital. But by the time I got there, I was suddenly very, very sick. I was beginning to get septic. And you sort of think, well, if I hadn't had that, th those things coming together, that helpful GP, you know, da -da 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 -da, I, I would probably have died, I suspect, if I hadn't have had that transfer that day to the hospital. I was that ill, you know. And you sort of think, well, what is that? Is that just the universe sort of, you know, deciding that, you know, we need a bit more warning? <laughs> Warney's got to have a, Warney's got to survive so he can meet Billy and, and have this, discussion and other people can be enlightened or whatever or, or just waste their time I don't know hopefully not waste their time um but but or, or, or you know was that just blind chance or was that God saying you know what um yeah Adrian's been allowed to suffer here um and he's, he's you know the, this, the world is the way it is he doesn't protect us from everything but actually enough you know there's a, there's a line here and I'm going to say right now is the time that things are going to change because for me it was like a huge change where on that day suddenly I was in good hands and, you know, they gave me the treatment I needed and rapidly things started to turn around, you know? And yeah, of course, I've had a lot of trouble since. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard because, of course, 
it flipping doesn't look like a loving God is looking after you some of the times I can tell you, especially if you're sitting here in my shoes and having had the, the last three and a half years I've had, you sort of think, well, if God was loving, I mean, if I had a kid, I wouldn't put him through what I've been through, you know? So, so that's where the challenge comes and, and it's a real challenge. And I think there are some people who, who come to atheism, not from a sort of, let's sit and look at the, you know, evidence for and against, da, 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 but who just say, look, I'm sorry, but if there is a God, I don't want anything to do with him because I can't see how he can be, be good. And there's the old, they call it the trilemma, I think it's called, where, you know, how can God be both loving and all powerful uh, and let these things happen, you know? And so, so that's the, in a way, that's the biggest question of the world, really. It's like, is this world just a cruel, heartless place where it's the survival of the fittest, you know, which is what evolution would say. And yeah. according to evolution, we shouldn't even care. It's like, you, you've, you've got a bald head? Oh dear. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a that's a, a harmful mutation. So actually, we hope you do die because we don't want you to pass that mutation on to your kids because you know there's going to be more skin cancer, so more trouble for the health. So right, Billy, no no reproduction for you. We'll find someone with a good head of hair like mine. <laughs> and he really no, but do you know what I mean? That's a silly yeah. thing to say, but it's, it's it's that idea. Why should it matter? Why do we care that we suffer? What, you know, when it, it shouldn't make any difference if the great grand scheme of things is to evolve the, the human race and make it stronger, fitter, better. You know, the Aryan race is, is something becomes a, a positive thing in, in some people's minds. And that's, that's that. I mean, our people argue that was what evolution, you know, un, 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 unentangled by any sort of moral view uh, of the value of humankind, even the weak ones. You know, you would you would go down that route. So well, let, let's let's breed the brightest. Let's be, breed the strongest. And let's let's artificially improve our race so that we have a better chance of recovering. And if some people suffer and fall by the wayside, so what? Um, because, you know, it's. It's just, it's just life. It's just survival of the fittest, you know? Well, yeah, you, you mentioned the trilemma. It's actually, how I understand that argument, it's, uh, there's four parts to it. Um, and I, I, I was just quickly looking up to remember it. I'm cheating by you. Oh, you cheat. You're cheating. You're cheating. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Google is my That's God. Okay. Uh, is God willing to prevent... Uh, it says the, the argument is evil, but we won't just say it, evil. We'll say, as you said, health. It's, it's suffering. It's really, yeah. Health, yeah. So is God willing to prevent suffering but not able? Then he's then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? For those who don't know what that means, so he hasn't got the so he's just not got the strength. So he's a nice guy, a bit like yeah. me and Billy. You know, we don't want anyone to suffer, so we would do what we could to stop it, wouldn't we? Yeah. So the argument goes: Is God willing to prevent uh, suffering but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then that would imply he's malevolent. Yeah, so he's a bad God, in other words. Let's, yeah. let's use simple words for, the, for some of our readers. But yeah, so, oh, sorry, yeah. so he, he's this evil. Yeah, he's a horrible dad. Yeah, so is he both able and willing? And if he's able and willing, then where does evil come from? But if he is neither able nor willing, then why call him God? And just a quick one on there. Why do we call God he? If God is on, uh, monotheistic, it can't, have, it can't have gender. So it just must be gender neutral god i assume but anyway those are the four arguments about oh the yeah <laughs> let's not get into the whole gender <laughs> thing as well that's, <laughs> a, that, that's the different but yeah so yeah. whenever you believe in god you know how you describe him that that issue comes up because it's and it's, it is a dilemma because um and it's the wrestle of life but it's also you see the thing is this right the bit that what they don't say about that is, is the alternative because the alternative is there is no god you know obviously and that's kind of the implication i mean they don't they, they, they often don't say it's quite clearly enough so it's like quid pro 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 we've proved it and there are plenty of atheists who 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 come to their atheism from that position you know i've, I've met a few you know where they, they grew up in a christian home something terrible happened you know maybe a, a loved one died you know or, or maybe they got sick and they were in pain or or they they read about you know terrible diseases in africa where i don't mm -hmm. know children's eyeballs are eaten up by 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 uh, by worms or something, and they go well. Look, this this universe doesn't look like it was designed by somebody loving, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so you end up with this position, and and that wrestle, that struggle, if you like, is is the struggle of faith. And it's a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to surprise the Christian by that. No, this is this has been talked about for thousands of years. I mean, it it starts off really in in the book of Job, which is probably the first book of the Bible to actually be written, even though it's not the first in the Bible, um, where you know there's a there's a guy who just basically his life falls apart. And, and he asked these questions and, you know, his mates say, oh, well, you know, uh, it's because you sinned. <laughs> it's you. 
And, and there's some element of truth to that in the sense that what the Christians would say is that the world isn't the way it was supposed to be, that it, there was this idea of fall and that it's a broken world and the world wasn't how God originally intended and that suffering entered the world not because of his intent, but because of our choices. But that isn't enough because obviously suffering isn't evenly spread out. It's not, or it's not fairly spread out. You know, it's not like, um, oh, right, yeah, let's count it out. This guy here, he's done this, this and this. So therefore he's getting all that punishment. No, it doesn't work like that. It's more like the universe is broken and random. And some people, you know, unfortunately they get a mutation, they get cancer. Oh dear, that's not because they've been a worse sinner than anyone else. You know, and then Jesus said that. I mean, Jesus said, look, you know, about these people that the tower fell on people said well, there was a, apparently some tower fell on them in his day and they said oh what, what happened there then and Jesus is like do you think that's because there were more sinners than you no no we're all in the same world basically and crap happened you know awful things happen to us and so at some point awful things happen to us and the, and the real question is how do we handle that do we therefore conclude there is no god that everything's random and uh, we've got no one looking after us um or, or do we somehow with some sort of mystery believe that whilst we can't have a satisfactory answer there must be an answer somewhere and that you know looking for evidence that for example suffering is limited a bit looking for evidence that there's a there's a future coming where it'll all be undone i mean this is the whole idea of heaven that you know this world is not our home um and looking for the idea that actually god entered into suffering and this is the, the specifically christian idea that jesus came um he suffered uh he saw our pain and he wept and he's with us in it and he sort of you know created if you like a, a rescue mission um in, and, and there's this whole idea of hope and resurrection and that, that you might go through all sorts of suffering but good will come out of it um both in the here and now but also ultimately in the future so this is sort of the the, the, the championing of hope which is an interesting thing because certainly whether you're a christian or not hope seems to be a very powerful force in people when they're suffering you know and um, people will go through all sorts of things like i don't know awful chemotherapy for example in the hope that the chemotherapy is going to help them and they get to a more positive future. So, you know, hope is about the future, isn't it? And, and, and of course, though, it kind of helps if you, if you believe there's a sort of all powerful being that's come help somehow with you in it all. So here's my question. How does an atheist have hope? Um, how does an atheist have hope? Well, is, is that designing whether you think it's a, a theistic model or just a human model? I think, you know, as a humanist, um, hope is just, the desire for luck to go our way, just to look for the, the uh, I've heard the phrase, God doesn't play dice, but perhaps atheists do. It's the fact that we're looking for the dice to roll our way. Um, I'm about to go into surgeries, you know, in a month or so. Uh, any surgery in, takes an inherent risk with it. I just hope the numbers are in my favor. So yes, I can have hope, uh, but I'd like to understand the risk involved before I take any, any yeah. risks. So, uh, perhaps it's just our different approach to uh, risk management. I will have trust in the fact that the surgeon who's going to operate on me has understanding and knowledge in his field. Uh, I have trust that the equipment to be used will do what it desires to do. I know there's a risk that I could come out a bit more damaged than I am. It's a risk I'm willing to accept. Uh, I'm just not looking for a, an inspiration for me to, uh, to drive that hope. So yes, I do have, have hope. I suppose, in a funny sort of way that you are, aren't you? Because your inspiration, in a sense, is the surgeon. You're putting your hope in the surgeon. Yeah. And yeah. In, in your model, I suppose, the surgeon, I'm not saying you're worshipping him, but he kind of takes the place, if you like, of, of God for the Christian, where the Christian will go, I believe that, you know, somehow this wise God, who I don't understand, who I've got all kinds of questions for, and believe me, yeah. I've got questions for him, like, what the heck, yeah, what's going on? Why don't you answer my prayers the way I want you to? You know, um, all kinds of questions for him. But somehow I still believe that he knows what he's doing. A bit like you believe that the surgeon knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I know things won't necessarily work out how I want them to. But I somehow trust my future into his hands. And I think that's the difference, isn't it? And it's an interesting thing because, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about a robot operating on you. Maybe, maybe you'd have more faith in the robot if you knew it was well designed. Maybe you'd have less faith because you wouldn't have had that relationship with the surgeon. There's something about sitting down with that, that guy and thinking, you know, and it's funny because in one sense, who cares how nice the surgeon is? You know, <laughs> you need his skill. But somehow some of them engender that sense of trust, that sense of his a sort of almost like a paternal figure, a, a, a caring figure, a parental figure who's looking after me and, and has my best interests at heart. And I can trust myself into his hands. I can, I can relax. I can let myself, you know, be put to sleep and yeah. believe that the anaesthetist won't kill me while I'm asleep, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, even in a sort of short-term temporary thing, I think 
for me anyway, believing that there's a God somehow behind it all kind of helps, but especially when I think about the whole of my life and the future and what comes, what comes next. Because I guess for you, I don't know, we've not spoken about this, I guess for you, you probably just think, you know, I didn't exist one day and one day I won't exist again. Um, and for a Christian, we, we obviously have this hope that, that there's an eternal future for us um, that, that's coming. And that makes everything worth, worth the pain. A bit like, you know, you go through the pain of surgery in order to hopefully come out the other end in a better health condition. Um, and the same thing for us, that this whole world, if you like, is like an, like an operation where God is, is preparing us for, for heaven. I mean, that's the kind of idea. Well, yeah, I could go with that. It's more than just the surgeon I have um, trust in. It's the entire systems we have, the NHS, the, our education system to train our bodies, our technology, yeah. you said, for the robotic. And it is a robotic surgery I'm going to be having. Uh, the robot's controlled by the experts. Um, but so, yeah, I just don't attribute an external cause of course of that. I'm more interested in ensuring that the systems that I can see and understand are working within a manner that is appropriate, shall we say. So it's a... Yeah, it's a trust in our structures and our systems. Um, you mentioned about then about heaven, etc. That I, I sometimes see uh, most religions, or in fact, I think all religions to an extent, have a solipsistic nature to it about the existence of self and the, the importance of self. And perhaps that's a big difference because if you were absolutely right, I didn't worry when I didn't exist, and I won't worry about not existing in the future. Uh, when I die. I see it as that's the end of the, this journey we have. But is there a degree of self-importance to have the concept of heaven, to say my life is too important in this huge universe to not have, uh, to have an unsatisfactory conclusion to it? Mm. So is the, the, the belief in, in heaven uh, a, almost a, a belief in fragility and not the desire to accept that a journey can come to an end? Yeah, I mean, you could argue that. Uh, although I think, I think the other interesting thing is that I think most of us have got at least some desire to continue, even if it's not necessarily, um, uh, you know, for our consciousness to continue. But the idea of legacy, I think um, there's a big, that's certainly a big drive, I, I would imagine, for you as well. I mean, I, I'm not sure you married, you've got kids. Or... I'm married, don't have children. And when we married, I, I wasn't even concerned whether my wife took my surname or not. That's her mm. decision. And no. I'm not too concerned about the legacy. But, but you, well, you say that, but I mean, surely when you die, you'd like to feel that, you know, you'd made an impact on some other people and that, you know, maybe some of the things you had achieved would live on in some way, in some small way that you've made the world a better place, perhaps, that you leave something I, behind. I, that is correct. That is correct. And that's how I sort of perceive immortality is, as you would say, is our legacy, our impact on the world. And hopefully our impact on the world is what we consider to be good. Um, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, at least on balance, because let's be honest, we also make a mess up as well. I mean, I do anyway, yeah. maybe it's me, but, you know, I, I've got lots of regrets and things that, you know, I, one of the problems with being off sick like I am is you get plenty of chance to reflect and you sort of think, oh, my gosh, all the mess ups I've made in my life, uh, the things I wished I'd done and things I wish I hadn't done. Um, so there's a lot of regrets. Um, but I guess there's also a sort of desire to try and put things right with which, whatever time I've got left, you know, whether it's short or long, um, to, 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 to hopefully be remembered positively um but for the christian it goes beyond that because we have this idea as you say you know perhaps a sort of slightly self-centered view almost that, that we, we, we will continue um and and that's i suppose that's you know that's really important to the christian that's why i suppose we're so keen to sort of share our views with others because we believe everyone will continue and, and there is this crucial you know thing that this world and what happens in this world affects what happens in the next you know and um, and there's mystery to that and you know, I think sometimes Christians get a little bit too, what's the word, too eager to be able to say, ah, yes, you see, you must do exactly like this um, in order to guarantee this. Whereas I don't think the Bible is quite as, as clear cut as that because it's not up to me to decide what's going to happen to someone else. You know, it's up to God to decide that. Um, but yeah, this idea that, that there is a right way to live and a wrong way to live, that's really quite important. And, and, and this is one of the interesting things, and I don't know if we've got time to address this fully, but... Um, you know, again, sort of the absolute, this is where the morals come in as well, because, you know, if we, we believe that, that morals have an absolute to them and that they're not just, you know, culturally determined. Obviously, they are culturally determined and how you interpret them will always be culturally inter determined. There's no, you can't get away from that. But this idea that if you go into almost all cultures and all religions, even that some of the things that like Jesus said um, seem to have a sort of resonance, you know, like, well, you know, treat people the way you'd like to be treated, you know, or at least... 
you know listen you know care consider other people's needs above your own don't just think about yourself don't don't just be selfish um you know kind of don't kill someone would be a good starting point you know because we'll go around, around in the world killing each other and all of these things and, and the idea of love you know the idea that um you know that we should be loving towards one another and kind towards one another which you know hand on heart i have to confess not all evangelicals are particularly kind people and you sometimes look at that and you think hey come on you know are you being like jesus or are you being condemning because i don't i don't get the feeling that jesus was like that but that's a whole different story i suppose but yeah this idea of morals you know it's like a lot of a lot of christians really struggle with the idea that you know where does a moral moral come moral system come from if there is no if there is no god if it's all just up to us you know if one person decides well actually my moral system is that i'm going to kill everyone you know who are we to tell them that they're wrong i mean obviously we can try and force them and stop them but how how can we persuade them that they're wrong if there is no absolute right and wrong to to appeal to you know yeah yeah that 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 is this is sort of coming full circle i think and exactly where i was hoping we were going to go with this discussion is that the absolute truth you're looking for is it that all about morals the absolute truth to ensure my journey to heaven is is I'll come up with it, but is that how you perceive absolute truth? And I want to know what to do right. Please help me. I want to go to a good place. Um, well, no, not just that I want to go to a good place. I want to be a good person. You know, I, yeah. I don't, I mean, I think it's, I mean, some people just see it as like a ticket to try and, as you say, get the right ticket, you know? And yeah. then it's like, what's the minimum? I mean, I've heard people talk about that, even Christians. So what's the minimum I can do, you know, <laughs> to, 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 to qualify, you know? It's like, hang on a minute, you know, it, it should be a little bit more than that because, I think if you're if all you're trying to do is scrape your way into heaven and then just live the, your own way in the meantime, that's that's not really helpful. And for me, it's more about being others focused. I mean, I think this is the critical thing for me. It's like if we believe in the selfish gene, you know, why shouldn't we be selfish? You know, why shouldn't it be about me and propagation? My genes actually in competition with your genes, because if my genes are better, than your genes, then my genes should recover. And so therefore, you know, why should I be, you know, what, in fact, you could almost argue that that being selfless, putting the needs of other people first, looking after the weak, making sure that the weak don't die, but maybe they can actually survive in order to breed. Even things like IVF. Why, why do we do IVF? You know, they're obviously as <laughs> I was watching Sherlock the other day and and it was a bit awful because um, the, 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 uh, the criminal described this particular his victim and he says this one's defective you know <laughs> and, and that's an awful view of humankind but you could argue that's a sort of logical view if you if you're purely atheistic and you're purely an evolutionist why should we try and fight against evolution isn't the whole nhs all about fighting the inevitable fighting the survival of the fittest i mean the nhs is about the survival of everyone not just the fittest yeah. and so from well, a christian point of view it makes sense because we're saying like we we want to love one another we want to serve one another we want to treat one another as we would like to be treated we want to be that sort of person and yes that, the, that sort of person is the sort of person that we would kind of like to be with in our future heaven <laughs> do you know what i mean so it's a little bit more than just i want to qualify um it's more about i want to know how to live my life now and to be the best person i can and to leave the best impact i can and ultimately, you know, if I'm wrong and we just die, you know, if I've lived a selfless life, then the impact I've left will hopefully be better than if I've left a selfish life. Now, of course, many atheists live selfless lives. My question is why? OK, well, I will, before, I'll answer that. In, well, I'll answer that in a minute. Just a quick question for you. Yeah. Can somebody who has been a good person on a human level, but not necessarily followed many of the tenets of Christianity, and broken broken some of the rules dictated by the bible yeah. that would allow you into heaven go into heaven can right, a good okay. person who's so, not a christian and broken rules go into heaven right, well, there's, there's two different questions there broken rules yeah. definitely um i mean all, there's a there's a character in the old testament king david who's described as a man after god's own heart yeah yeah and he's one of the biggest heroes of the whole bible uh, apart from jesus he's got loads of chapters written about him he wrote most of the psalms he was the worship leader he was the the, the darling king of he murdered someone after committing adultery. Um, and after he'd done that, God still described him as a man after his own heart. And why? Because he repented and because, he, you know, he, uh, he went to God and asked for forgiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And because, you know, that one terrible sin that he did, that one terrible mistake he made doesn't define him. And that, that idea of redemption is really critical in, in, in the Bible, as opposed to a lot of other religions where, you know, once you've made your mistake, that's it. You're done, you know? So, yeah. so in terms of breaking rules, absolutely um in terms of the whole business about you know you, you know how someone qualifies and and all of that i think there's mystery in it i think i really do i think there's mystery in it i think 
um, all kinds of you, you could you could argue this way that way but but ultimately what the christian believes is the only way to be sure of being in heaven is to be in that relationship with god but that doesn't mean that everyone who thinks they're in that relationship will get there because i mean jesus said um many will come in that day saying lord lord did we not do this and that do? and he'll say no away from me i never knew you and that's talking to the religious people so there are religious people who won't make it um mm -hmm. but i rather suspect that there may be unreligious people who will um, and because it, there are s s certain hints about it, like it talks about, you know, that each of us in our own conscience has something judging us and not judging us. And it's like God, will, God will determine that in some way. You know, and there's this idea that there's a mystery. And, and what was it Paul said? He says he, he determines everyone's place and hope that they'll reach out to him. And uh, we just don't know. I mean, the mystery. I mean, I know recently I, I heard a, a, a story of, of somebody who, you know, who very clearly had a deathbed conversion. And I think, you know, for him. You know, that was very dramatic. And if he'd have lived, I'm sure he would have carried on living as a Christian, but he didn't live. And so do I think he's in heaven? Yes. You know, do I think that I'll be surprised when I get to heaven that there'll be some people there? I think, what are you doing here? Yes. But do I also think I might be surprised when I think, oh, why is that person not here? Yes. You know, so it's, to me, it's between the, that individual and God. God's the judge. I'm not going to sit and yeah. try and sort people. You know, he talks about sorting the sheep from the goats. He talks about, you know, the, the weeds and the tares or the, the weed, the the weeds and the and the the actual corn if you like growing together and that when harvest comes he'll sort it out you know so it's to me it's that way and um you know i think there are i, I don't know i just I, I i'm not i'm not sure if i'm making much sense here but um, i'm sounding a bit woolly i'm sure some of my christian friends will be really annoyed with me because they'd like me to say repent or you will definitely perish you know um, and, um, and, as, an yeah. atheist, as an atheist unless i had a conversion i would not be able to be accepted into the kingdom of heaven well, I mean, look, I, I mean, yeah, but who knows what happens at the moment if someone dies? I don't know. You know, who knows what happens um, in that in those few moments? You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sit here and say, you know, that I am God and I'm telling you this is what's going to happen to you. And it's interesting. The Bible isn't very clear about that. The Bible does say quite clearly there will be a hell and there'll be some people in it. Um, and, it, you know, and it also seems to imply that we all deserve that. Um, and um, and obviously the way out of that is to is to get to the point where you realize that you deserve it. And, th and there's this thing called repentance. So to what extent someone can repent <laughs> and live a good life and live a life for other people, you know, and, and sort of follow their conscience, if you like, and, and actually somehow be in a relationship with God and not even really realize it. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's between them and God, you know, but I think, I think, yeah, I mean, there's, there is a view by the way that there is no such thing as an atheist, some Christians say. Um, that, that, that actually secretly you all believe I, I, don't, I think that's probably not the case but but I think there are some people like that there are some people who have some kind of relationship with God but don't talk about it uh, or some people that reach out to God in, in a certain moment and pray and connect with him um, but but ultimately the critical thing I think is is pride I think so many people and this is why the religious folk need to be careful because so many people trust in themselves they don't trust in God at all and for me it's about trust in in, in something outside of yourself and recognition that you're you're not the, the 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 thing that you think you are you're not you know you're not the be all and end all and that you need help and that's the christian message specifically that actually it's not even about me fighting my way into heaven it's about god coming down to me and saving me and so i mean things like the superhero narrative is quite interesting because it's this idea that we need saving and so yeah. you know so the bible's certainly for people before jesus came the idea was that they by looking forward for that savior there was an element of faith, you know, that they didn't know it was all about Jesus on the cross and all that, but they knew that God needed to save them somehow. And by, by, by reaching out and saying, help, help, that was enough. And I, I certainly think, you know, for anyone watching, you know, if you're not sure um, and you want to reach out, you know, you don't have to have this great, amazing faith. You just have to say, God, I need your help. Please help me. And often that little step is the, is the step that, that turns everything around rather than I'm going to help myself. But, you know, and, and that is what is what is the beginnings of faith. And, Yes, you know, obviously I would love everyone to become a Christian and I think that's the best way to be sure you're on your way to heaven if you know that you've got that relationship with Jesus and you know that you're walking with him and you could argue that's arrogant um, but, but it's, it is actually the opposite of that. It's about going, I've trusted myself. You know, it's a bit like being strapped into, we're talking about that, that rocket. You know, I'm strapped into the rocket. He's in control of my life and hopefully he's got the destination sorted out versus I'm in control. So I, I don't know. So, so, yeah. Yeah, so it is very interesting. I think we're all getting to this concept of why we, why you have a desire to seek absolute truth, and perhaps mm. why I don't. But 
can I go back to a bit on morals? You're asking about where yes. as a do I get my morals. Um, a couple of areas, actually. One is, as I said, I'm a humanist, uh, which is as close to a sort of ideology as atheism will get. Uh, is it a religion? I would argue no, it's not, but it is a kind of philosophy. And that philosophy is that we actually get our moralistic behaviour from our interaction with each other, from our understanding. We are sentient after all, and we have a capacity for thought. And within that, it, that evolution would allow us to generate a form of right or wrong. Because as you said, it's about survival of the fittest, as you know, that's sort of a very uh, let's say, simplistic way of trying to understand evolution, isn't it? But it's not about, it's how we define what is the fittest there. And as you said, the, the selfish gene is the right thing. It's the genes that continue. It's the genes that allow for procreation and reproduction. And that is not an individualistic thing. Because if it became individualistic, species would die out rapidly. If it became just about me and I will massacre everything in my wake to ensure I survive, that species will not survive because it will reach a dead end. So evolution must drive us to have some form of inbuilt moral behavior to protect our children. So look at how many, almost every species of mammal we're aware about has an inbuilt uh, moral compass to protect its children. And then when we look at pack animals, they protect each other's children and they f fend off attacks from outside. That has to be a form of moralistic behavior. And that's a moral behavior that could be driven by evolution. I'm going to say could, and so I don't want to be. Yeah. So, and also then, so species evolve an inbuilt form of what we would consider moral behavior because it's preservation of life. Um, I then believe that when we got to a, a sentient level, uh, when we have an understanding, then that growth of preserving life that is inbuilt as an already can be qualified on a thought process that other species are not capable of. So then we can form our moralistic behavior about what helps with the continuation of humanity. Uh, so that's where I see my moral drive from. Morals I don't believe are absolute. I believe they evolve and they're flexible dependent on situations. There are other faiths that have a different set of moral codes than Christianity. There are many aspects of what the Bible may see, personally I consider to be very immoral. Um, I, I, we won't get bogged down in these topics. I'm sure you can guess some of them, but um, the Bible, for instance, codifies slavery. Uh, and I find that very, very strange. You know, it, it, the Bible talks about how you can dictate which of your slaves marry which slaves and how much you are allowed to beat a slave by. I believe, isn't it, three days? If they live for more than three days after the beating, that's an acceptable beating for a slave. How can I, uh, as an atheist, accept that as a moral code? And how can you as a Christian? So. You, I assume that most Christians must accept that morals evolve and change over time. I don't see the Bible as being particularly moralistic, um, particularly when I look at the Ten Commandments, and only I think only four of them really are about human behaviour. Um, most about is about idolising and not disrespecting God. Uh, it's a it's a too easy statement to make, but I can't make it. But I don't really believe it. Some people say, why don't the Ten Commandments talk about rape or child abuse? Uh, it, that would make Ten Commandments too big. You need a million commandments if we were going to go into what does codify our moral behaviour. But that's so, I, I believe I get my mor we get our morals from evolution and interaction, the two together. I do find it strange that we have people who don't buy into that. Is that genetic mutation? Yes, it could well be. Take, for instance, I'm actually quite fascinated by psychopaths, as I've met, uh, mentioned before, and psychopaths can show immoral behaviour because they are so self-absorbed and self-important and have no empathy. Yet, you look at surgeons, and there's a very high percentage, of, relatively high percentage of surgeons who are psychopaths. Surgeons tend, sorry, psychopaths can tend to surgery, CEOs, banking. That's where we can see them, because a huge self-belief helps there. So I would look at, you could look at many surgeons and say, are they moral? Yes, they're doing it because they're helping people and they're making them live longer, which is endemically moral behavior. But at the same time, they may be doing it because they've got a God complex and they believe they can control, control people's lives. And we hear these stories. So I, has that summed up where I believe I get uh, my morals from? I hope so. I believe morals are flexible. I believe they evolve over time. They're situation dependent. Um, and I can see the existence of morals without there having to be a guiding force to do so. Because I can see how we, as I've mentioned, every species evolved and we as humanity, the only ones who are sentient, are capable of taking that to a level 
this is exactly why you and I are talking now because we have yeah. this capability. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, we've been chat chatting for an hour, so we're going to have to draw, draw okay. things to a close. But I, I guess I'll try and just really briefly answer a couple of things there. One is um, my question remains though: who gets to decide what these models are? You know, so this is this is the issue. Um, yeah. Is it just the vote? Um, or, or what you know and, and who gets to decide who votes i mean that, that's the issue so that's where you know having some sort of absolute basis for them uh, and in terms of the bible and, and the in the way in which the moral code sort of evolves in the bible i think you, you have to read the bible with the understanding that you know the old testament particularly was written in, in, a, in a very brutal violent time and it's about taking people from a sort of completely lawless violent brutal kind of just like the chimpanzees almost you know through on a journey towards you know the new testament type of, 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 of moral view and so you know the, the good example uh, would be the eye for the eye the tooth for the tooth you know because that's literally you know the idea of that was you know under the old sort of system people would literally if, if someone you know punched you then you murder five of their friends and then they murder 10 of yours and you're, you're at that situation you were talking about where everyone's wiped out so the idea originally was like, look, if you're going to extract vengeance, limit it. One eye, one eye, you know. And then Jesus comes along and says, actually, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other one. You know, we'll, we'll get rid of vengeance altogether. So as you can see, a, there is a sort of sense of a journey there and a sort of trajectory. And um, and that would be the argument um, for, for some of the, the other issues that you mentioned. And we, we could spend a lot of time arguing about the details of all of that. But I think it's that's the sort of idea, this trajectory. So we would, So in that sense, we would agree on that. But the difference, I suppose, would be that I would see God sort of behind that in driving us towards the person of Jesus, who's the person, you know, what would Jesus do would be my question. How is Jesus? You know, I want to follow him. I want to follow his. And his teaching is quite amazing and um, quite, quite, quite wonderful, really. Um, and there is a lot that we can learn from that, the sort of the meekness and, and the attitudes and all of those things. But, but you know, I, I get that many, many atheists are very moral people. I, I guess the issue I would just have is, you know, it, as you said yourself, it, it isn't that absolute. And sometimes when it's not absolute, there's a temptation in certain situations to bend the rules, you know, or to change the rules. And that can be good uh, in some circumstances, you might argue. Uh, it's like the whole dilemma, do you lie to the Nazis when they come for the Jews, you know? <laughs> Those kinds of issues um, become quite interesting. And you'd be, believe, you'd be amazed that some Christian ethicists really kind of struggle with that whole issue as, you know, what can you sin in order to do good, you know, things like that. So. I don't know. It's been a fascinating chat, though, Billy. And I, I, I guess just before we finish, I'd love to give you the last question. word, really, because... Well, I don't want the last word. It's your podcast. I'll let you... I mean, OK, I, what I was going to ask, didn't that kind of moralistic behaviour exist before Jesus and other societies anyway? Yeah, um, but, but there's, um, there's an evolving coming coming through, you know. It's, I think I think he kind of gave expression to it and uh, in a way that has sort of been seen but as the pinnacle by many people, I think. Many people yeah. would argue he was the greatest teacher. Doesn't mean that he that all of those ideas were completely new to him. No, I think he just gave expression to some of those ideas in a, in a pretty precious way. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll, I'll do my little wrap up bit then because it was about absolute truth. Um, yeah. I think that maybe the difference between us two is that I don't have a, I don't think I have the need to find absolute truth. I think I can accept my life as it is based on probabilistic models and observation observations and say yes i understand my moral code and our hopefully is identical nearly identical moral code but i don't see a need to absolutely understand that uh because i don't perhaps we might agree on this perhaps we can't perhaps girdle is correct we cannot understand the system we're in from within the system okay that's great and i guess my point is really fundamentally this you know have I asked myself the question, can God be good? And is there a God considering the mess that the world's in and my own personal suffering and the suffering I see in others? Of course I have. Um, but ultimately, I guess I've come to the, the conclusion and you could call it a weakness if you like, that I have to believe in God almost because the alternative is just too desperate and too hopeless that this world is completely random and, and that there's nothing to look forward to at the end. So, you know, um, maybe that's a weakness, maybe that's a strength. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I well, but I guess the future will tell, won't it? I mean, this is the thing. Um, and there's that, it reminds me for some reason of that kind of, um, you know, slightly, I don't know if you've heard this one. It's like, you know, if, well, what have you got to lose, you know? <laughs> if I'm, if I'm wrong, what have I got to lose? If you're wrong, what have you got to lose? But, but that is, but that really speaks to the whole thing because to me it matters whether it's right or wrong. It matters whether it's true or not. Um, because, 
you know, if I am building my whole life on a lie, you could argue that I'm just a deluded person. I, I should be, I mean, some people would argue that all religious people are just deluded and delusional and mentally ill, you know, and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in one sense, a sweet delusion, because, I mean, you look at the fruit of it, there's certainly a lot of good that comes from faith people, but also a lot of good that comes from people like yourself who don't have a faith. So it's an well, interesting... From both sides, we could argue that ignorance is bliss. I'm happy with the ignorance of not having to have a meaning to my life or a, a, a continuation of it and not necessarily understand it. I'm happy with the bit of ignorance I've got. Uh, and I'm sure you could apply, apply that ignorance is bliss philosophy to certain areas of Christianity. It's about Life's yeah. about being happy and making other people happy. And if you do that in your life, I think generally you're a good person. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, critically this, you know, we live in a world where there are lots of people like you and there are lots of people like me. Mm -hmm. And if we have an environment where we all hate each other and we're trying to stamp each other out and we're trying to shut each other up and cancel each other or silence each other or think that the, the other person is just an idiot, I think we've got a problem. I think we need to be you know, able to have the sort of respectful conversations we've had today where, you know, we can explore these things. We can agree to disagree, but we can do so in, in, in an agreeable way and in a way that, is good for society because look you know we need people like you doing good in society and we need people like me doing good in society rather than like throwing rocks at each other and that's what worries me a little bit especially as we look at our friends over the pond at the moment there's a little bit too much rock throwing going on you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i could I, I think that's a very wise way to wrap it up <laughs> yeah. let's let's uh, stop throwing rocks at each other and let's sit down and talk okay eh, instead <laughs> I, don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's like going back to the ancient times, isn't it? They're all, they're all, we're all divided into our tribes, throwing rocks at each other rather than sitting down and having a powwow. <laughs> well, in, in what is it, eight, nine days since now, since I, I've got to know you, you have changed the way I perceive the world. Uh, I'd like to think almost everybody I speak to somehow changes. The yeah, way you, well, similarly. I, I want to try to understand what drives religious beliefs, uh, because if I understand what drives your beliefs and other people's differing beliefs better, I can actually be more respectful to you. I can yeah, and same thing the other way around. Yeah. Instead of creating this straw man atheist that, yeah. that many of us have. And I mean, let's be honest, there's, there are plenty of examples. I mean, we can look at, I mean, for the Christian, we look at someone like Richard Dawkins and think all atheists are like him and they all, all hate us, you know? Uh, and probably he doesn't hate us as much as his sort of image, <laughs> you yeah. know, that, that people have of him does. But, you know, that's certainly that kind of, and I'm sure that a lot, for a lot of atheists, they see sort of the angry Christian, you know, denouncing um and, and and even sounding hateful actually many many christians you know that you see on the media or whatever you know i don't know protesting or something and and just sort of shouting or standing at the street corner saying turn or burn all those sorts of yeah. things you know hopefully it's, as we get to know each other we can see actually maybe maybe we don't meet the caricatures quite as much as some people think we do yeah. well yeah uh, i think what you said then about uh dorkings and, and people can be like that is effectively a spin of um, I think he would look at it to use a Christian term, love the sinner, hate the sin. I don't yeah. believe the atheists hate Christians because that would be irrational. Uh, with people with the same diversity and no matter what. But it what can it, look like that, that's the point. It can look like that. And, and, and in a way, the media encourages that, you know? The, the image that's put across, can, and especially online and social media and all the sort of angry rock throwing on both sides, you know, can, you, you can end up with a false perception of what, what the other person's like, you know? And I think. Maybe people are not quite as bad as we think they are, you know? I don't know. Well, well let me we give you something now. I'm going to tell you something quite brutal about myself, in a way, here. And, and imagine if you think about it, I think you could apply the same from the other side. Um, I absolutely respect the right of anybody to have whatever philosophies mm. and theologies they want to have. Uh, I absolutely respect your right to Christianity, and I don't, would never dream of taking that right away from you. However, I'll be honest and say, do I respect Christianity? Some ways, yes, some ways, no. I don't think the Bible gives a particularly strong moral code in many areas. So how could I respect that? How can I respect some people in religion who believe homosexuality is wrong? Because I think that's immoral to think homosexuality is wrong. But I can respect your standpoint and understand your standpoint, and that's important. Um, do I think the world will be a better place without religion? I'd be a fool with my thoughts if I said, didn't say yes. But I would imagine from your point of view, you'd say, do you think the world would be a better place if everybody was a Christian? I can't believe that you wouldn't say yes. Yeah, exactly. And so, so it's not wrong for us to want to persuade each other. It's not wrong for us to believe in our views. 
And I guess we've just got to have the respect to allow people to be wrong in our minds, you know, and to recognise that people that we think are wrong can actually also be contributing in a really positive way to society. And they're not they're not our enemies, you know, just because yeah. they're, they're wrong. You know, I mean, it's, it's a bit like the flat earthers or the anti-vaxxers, you know, I'm not going to line up anti-vaxxers and shoot them all um, <laughs> as much as, you know, they might be frustrating and they might be all of us at risk. You know, mm -hmm. actually what we need is we need to be able to find ways to, to reach out and be persuasive and gentle and kind and, and show people that, that, that we're not the hateful beings that we sort of think we are. And I think that otherness, the tribalism is really, really the big issue that we do love to build tribes and to mm -hmm. think that our tribe is perfect and the other tribe is not. And, yeah. and I think hopefully we've shown that's not the case in this conversation. So anyway, I really want to be getting on. Um, I've got to go and worship my, my God that you don't believe in. Um, and... Um, <laughs> You've got to do what everyone does there. on a Sunday morning, so. He, he may be there, I just can't, I just don't accept the evidence. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right, well, thanks again. It's lovely to talk, and we'll speak Thank again. You, Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Well, you've made it to the end of an episode of Adrian Warnock's Christian Podcast. You must have some stamina. Well done. And if you liked what you heard, you know what to do. Subscribe, review, Tell all your friends about it. And in the meantime, why not visit adrianwarnock.com?